Good evening, everybody. It is now 545, and I'm going to call the meeting to order. Janet, would you please start with our roll call attendance? Ross Curley. Here. Craig Westfall. Here. Tracy Hennis. Here. James Gum. Here. Tina Pridemore. Here. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Motion by Jim. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Craig. I would like to recommend that we move the um, tour to the end of the meeting. So that is the one exception that I would like to see. Um, so I'd like to see that part of the agenda changed. Are there any other requests regarding the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the agenda with the moving of the Tour of the new facilities to the end of the meeting. Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We're going to go forward with the agenda. Um, well, up we up next we have our recognitions, our student recognitions, and I'll let Mr. Walters take it over. Sure. Thank you. I can't see in the audience, um, but is Grace Schmidt in the audience? There she is. Thanks for coming, Grace. Um, Grace was recognized as the Daily News Player of the Year for girls softball. And I know Grace is excited to come to the microphone as a senior and tell us about some plans for next year. So again, congratulations, Grace Schmidt on Daily News Player of the Year, girls softball. <laughs> and I don't know if we have some questions up there or not, Grace, but um, are they there? Awesome. Why don't you give us the questions so everybody in the audience knows what they are and tell us your story. Hold on, not, hold on, not so fast. Give us, for all of us non-Goshen College experts, please tell us where that is and what type of school that is. Mike's yeah, turn your mic on. I think I turned it, yep, you got it, there. Now we're going. Okay, I'll restart. So I'll be attending Goshen College and I'll be pursuing a degree in psychology and playing softball. Um, Goshen College is a liberal arts school in northern Indiana, about four hours from here. Um, advice that I would give to incoming freshmen is probably to just have a lot of fun and enjoy the time while it lasts because before you know it, you'll be heading into your freshman year of college and it feels like yesterday you were coming into high school as a freshman. Um, my favorite memory of my time here at high school was probably every season that I got to play softball. Just enjoying the time with my teammates and playing and especially the last season that we had my senior year was just an amazing season overall and that's probably one of the greatest things I'll remember from high school. Yep. Awesome. Thank you again. Best of luck in six days and thanks for your artwork in the health office. Yeah. And then our next recognition is Rebecca Steckman who I believe just Walked in behind me, um, similar to Grace for girls softball, but Rebecca Steckman was our the Daily News Player of the Year for girls soccer. And Rebecca is going to be a senior next year, so she will not have to answer the three questions until next year when we recognize her for something outstanding next year. Uh, but again, congratulations, Rebecca Steckman, Daily News Player of the Year for girls soccer. And that's our student recognitions. We would like to take a quick photo op with both Grace and Rebecca back by the backdrop in the back of the hall. We'll be back in a second.
late as usual. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the recognitions for this evening. Up next on our agenda is the public comments portion of the meeting. Per board policy, this meeting is a meeting of the Hartford Union High School District Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not a public community meeting. The public is welcome to address the board. Public comment for this meeting is limited to items that are posted on the agenda, specifically in the old business and the new business sections. Each person wishing to make public comments will have time to make them as determined by the presiding officer. The board or administration may respond to your comments at a later date. You may also provide your comments with copies to each board member and the superintendent. No public comment will be heard that the presiding officer deems to be critical of an individual or group, either by name or reference. Also, per board policy, the presiding officer may interrupt, warn, or terminate a speaker's statement when the statement is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. Please direct any such comments to the principal or the superintendent for administrative action. Comments on other agenda items and non-agenda items should be submitted in writing or email with copies to each board member and the superintendent. We do have a couple of folks who signed up to address the board tonight. I would just ask that when you come forward to talk to the board, please state your name, your address, and whether or not you have a student in our district. So up first we have Janice Johnson. Janice, would you like to come forward and address the board, please? I'm sorry, and please also state which agenda item you're going to be speaking to. Good evening. I'm Janice Johnson Griffin. I live at 6419 Highway Q. I've been a resident there since 84. My husband and I don't have any children, but I'm very concerned about the budget and how we can be very responsible as ta for taxpayers for our investment in the school systems. And I'm not always sure that the education product that we're investing in is always the best. And I just would like to encourage a high standard for our pupils, for our children. And as a taxpayer with no children in the school system, 
but I'm very concerned about the product that's coming out of the schools. So thank you for your time. This is my first time here. Um, it's been very educational, and I am very concerned as a taxpayer. Thank and, you for addressing the board. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And I think um, we need to make sure that students get the best we can provide for them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Johnson. I would invite I miss Johnson. Ms. Johnson, I'd love to have a conversation with you individually to talk more about that. Louise, thank you. Louise Shrunk has also signed up to address the board tonight. And I ask that we please try to limit comments to two minutes long. Louise Shrunk, I live in 759 Aspen Drive here in Hartford and I have a junior. Um, and I have three more kids coming here. So um, my question for you, or actually it's just a recommendation maybe, um, I was at the school board meeting for joint one and they were also talking about CRT, which was a conversation that happened last meeting. So I just wanted to present this letter that Dr. Schmitz had written for all of us students in the K-8 program. I thought it was very well written and very simple. You know, basically stating that the curriculum has no intentions and we do not include CRT. Ms. Trunk, can I just stop you? Yep. Um, there's nothing related to curriculum on the agenda this evening. It was supposed so, to be on from last month because that was yeah, delayed it, for it's approval. Not on, it's not on the agenda this okay. evening. I'd certainly love to take the letter from you okay. at some point. Sure. Um, but at this point in time, um, there's no discussion around curriculum this month. Okay. I would certainly invite you back. No, nope, it's um, fine. I thought it was not going to be on this agenda because no. school's starting. So. Just, and, and, and for those listening, the board was given some of the materials that were requested previously. Perfect. Thank you. Janice, please feel free to forward that on to the board in an email as well if you'd like. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address the board? All right, hearing none, we're going to go forward in the agenda. Up next, we have report, reports and communications, and we actually do have student board representatives in the audience. Thank you for being here. So whenever you're ready, just come on forward to the podium and give us your current report. I guess I'm pretty washed up. It's a little different in this room. That's okay. You're good. You're doing fine. Yeah, football practice ended, and I ran to the cafeteria, and I did a full lap around the library before figuring out it was in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess I'll go first, and we hop to the next slide. Oh, man, I really am washed up. I think Mrs. Jacob is saying point it behind you. <laughs> All right, man. Um, so the big thing when it comes to my senior class is we are really hoping, like I use the word desperately, that we're able to return to a completely normal year. Uh, I'd say last year overall, we always felt bad for the seniors saying like, oh man, this is your last year and you weren't able to do it. And now as we see that there's a chance that it might wind up somewhat similarly, it kind of goes to like a reality setting in that there might be a chance that next year might be somewhat similar to last year. But everyone is really crossing their fingers. And I, on the football team, I talk a lot of our players and they said that they're excited to have real fans back, which hurt a little bit because our fans there were our parents. So I'm not sure what they're trying to say about them. But it is nice, though, when we have the cheers going and everyone's going wild. And I do like when we win games and you hear the na 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 going on as the other team walks off the field. It really makes you feel like you're more involved in the community and you're not just playing for your friends, but you're a part of something even bigger than just what's going on in the field. Uh, and I, yeah, as I said before, it's I love going to the games. I wasn't playing in them. It's still, it's kind of just like a big school event, and I feel like it's going to go beyond just uh, football. But also when basketball starts back up, I always felt like I was. Spike Lee just talking with my cousin on the slinger side, even though I don't think it made too much of an impact. Uh, another big thing about next year is there are some kids who are becoming more optimistic about the block schedule. 
Uh, it, to a lot of kids, like this seems like their first real year under the new, uh, I'll say, Walters era of school, where uh, I, I feel like last year was more the decisions you couldn't really implement them right away because of all the stuff that went down. But this is like the official opening of what your vision was for HUHS. And I feel like it'd be important that you make sure that you're seen around the hallway along with our new principal as well, because I... I can't lie, I didn't really know a lot of the changes that Dr. Weniger made, but I can tell that we all loved it when he uh, came in his last day and talked to all the students about how great we were and gave kids high fives. It's, I mean, you can do things like renovate and the changes, but just being well-liked by being well-seen is, I think will go a long way. And a big thing for the students is that I, I, don't, I think that the block is gonna go a lot better than everybody says it will, but a lot of kids are worried that they're gonna get in trouble, I think, a lot the first week for like, not paying attention. I wasn't really sure they're going with this one, but it's technically my job to say that. So I'm just going to subtly say that I disagree with it while still talking about it. Uh, there are a couple concerns about this year. As I said before, is we just we are absolutely desperate to have a normal year again, where I was so excited to run student council's homecoming last year. And then when we kind of realized that I August, I was going to be nothing like that. It would be absolutely heartbreaking to not just me, but to everyone else if I couldn't do, or we <laughs> couldn't do a homecoming, having like the roar, the pep rally, or pep rally crowd, having the parade. It would just be so great. Uh, the thing is, is that I, I have to say on my own though, that if it does keep going up with the cases, I would personally say that I would rather have us wear masks and limit stuff again, than they have to go virtual because I, I went virtual twice, I got quarantined, and as bad as it was, having masks and staying apart, it was still a lot better than having to sit home with very little accountability of, or motivation for me to try and get stuff done. Um, like we, we were talking as friends, and talking about what our hopes were for this year, and we were, it almost sounded like, I, I felt like at the start of the Packers season, where I feel like everything is way overly optimistic, even though it Packers still haven't won in 10 years, so it rarely goes exactly how we planned, but we're hoping that it's still we're able to get something close to a regular year. A uh, big thing I've been hearing in the past couple of weeks is the schedule. Uh, it's been a really big deal. Like Kids put their uh, schedules on their Snapchat and talk with their friends about it, and they love to have a whole lot of notice about it. And this, the counselors have been uh, getting a lot of hate from the kids about uh, how long it's taken to get the schedules up. So I really, I originally was on the kids' side of this when I was a freshman, but I talked to my counselor a lot this year, and I had to get my schedule changed, and I can say that it's not the counselor's fault at all. I mean, I had to go in to meet him twice, like two half-an-hour-long meetings, and then they got to go through. It's like trying to make a puzzle, but the pieces don't like fit together. You got to just jam them together to get everyone's schedule going. It is so tough for the counselors to get everything done, and I really feel like that you guys got to like chat with them or something and ask them what you can do to make it better. Cause I feel like it'd be such a win-win because the kids love it. It's a good way to get the school on their side is to get the schedules out early and just uh, helping out the counselors would also be incredible. I feel like they'd, <laughs> I feel like they'd be uh, really awesome for next year. Thank you. Hi, I'm JP, last year's freshman board rep, and I got to start off with having a normal high school experience this coming sophomore year for myself and for Vinny's senior year. I completely agree that the sporting events were such a miss last year for my freshman class that they didn't really get to experience the first year of high school correctly, and I believe that if these are back, then I feel like we'll all be happier and in a better set of mind for this coming fall, especially big football games and basketball games. I definitely missed out on those. Uh, Definitely a new, fresh learning environment is what I hope for this year. With the new block schedule, I'm really optimistic about what it can bring to benefit our education. Now I'm going to shift the subject a little bit to how things went for my summer. I know I could fill in time a little bit here, but uh, I think that my summer was very high impact and always go, go, go with baseball. And traveling around the Midwest was just very interesting to me. Getting to have all of experiences with the coaches and talking to colleges was just a great experience to have. Uh, along with trips, my family traveled to some cities like Chicago, Indianapolis, and Miami to talk to colleges about baseball and just to have a fun time down there. Um, our summer strength and speed classes at the high school were very beneficial to me. 
especially with football starting up to get me ready and stronger for the upcoming season. So that's all I got for tonight. Thank you. Nice to have our board reps back. Vincent, you're another round? Or? Yeah, Taylor was unable to make it today, but she did want me to say that uh, in her grade, they are feeling a lot better than they were before when it comes to the block schedule. I mean, change is, with anything, is scary at first, but I feel like as we're going to get in closer to the new year, kids are going to kind of get embrace it a little more. And basically, she had the same ideas I did, where kids are just crossing their fingers and praying that we're able to have a normal year. It looks like she had a lot more fun than I did this summer. So... <laughs> Awesome, thank you. And, and if I caught if I caught Vinny's message from his first round of conversation, he was talking about hope versus expectation in reference to Packers. Obviously, those people my age remember pre Brett Favre days when we have no hope or expectation or aren't Bears, Bears fans. Thank you. Um, up next is our communication, starting with donations. Yeah, but just one donation this evening. Uh, appreciation to our Hartford Select Baseball Club, who has donated $500 um, to the HUHS Athletic Department. Um, again, we appreciate the partnership of all of our youth organizations, community, and industry partners that keep supporting HUHS. So again, thank you to the Hartford Select Baseball Club. And then with that, uh, Mr. Helms has a brief co-curricular update that he'd like to share with everyone. Well, Vinny and JP, I can tell you that we will have fans in the stands come Friday night, and we'll open it up for all sporting events for our students and fans in our community, so we're excited about that. Um, one change you will see is we are going digital ticketing, um, so you will purchase your uh, tickets online um, and then have a QR code at the front gate and just scan it in as you come in, or you can pay with a credit card. So we're advancing our ticket sales as well. Um, all fall sports are as of today, are um, going strong. Uh, we got healthy numbers, so that's exciting. Uh, we've already had a couple major golf meets uh, with Ashley Hattori actually having a hole-in-one on her first uh, golf meet last Thursday at Washington County, so that was exciting. Um, our tennis team won two out of three of the matches on, on Saturday, um, and all the other sports are full go now, uh, with Friday night being our first home football game and obviously Ozzy Fest to open that up. Um, there is a memo in your board packet about two new clubs uh, that we are uh, recommending to start here at HUHS. Um, one is a equestrian club. Right now we have two to three students who are interested in co-oping with the Slinger Club, um, and they will start competition immediately in September uh, with the state competition starting in October. <coughs> We're also starting um, a Fellowship of Christian Athletes. We will be supplying them with a space to meet. Um, we have several staff members, Coach John Redders and Coach Aaron Hauser um, are two of our staff members who will be advising that group. Uh, Kaylin Knutson will be our student leader. Um, Coach Hauser and Kaylin are both in the audience. Um, so if we have any questions for them about the FCA and the start there, uh, they are here for any questions. But two new clubs, no cost to the district, but just giving our students to be connected to our, our district and community. That's all I got. Any questions, questions for Mr. Helms? Uh, Mr. Helms, I guess I'm, I'm looking very forward to the new clubs coming on board. My question is for the, the FCA group. I know at Slinger, I believe it ended up being a pretty big group. I think they welcomed in um, even students who weren't athletes, if, if, I'm, if, if what I was told is correct. So how are we inviting kids into that club? Uh, we'll make announcements, social media, as well as here at school, uh, once they decide what dates they're going to meet and what times. Uh, but Slinger's group did get to 50 or 60 students at a time, meeting in the mornings um, or after school. Awesome. I know they did give donuts in the mornings, too, so that may have been part of their draw, but they do have a large okay. group as well as many other schools in our conference. Wonderful. Thank you. No. Typically during a board meeting, I'm sorry, no, okay. the, the public address comment section is at the beginning of the meeting. But if you have any questions for any of us or Mr. Helms, please feel free to send us an email after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And again, it's exciting that our students have more opportunities available to, available to them, so we're excited for those couple of uh, new additions to our campus. Uh, next, our curriculum director, Mr. McIntyre, will lead a presentation through our new HUHS district performance pillars.
right, I always get nervous if this is going to work or not. And I saw that we had a little bit of a struggle, so and I did not have football practice. I've not been running all over. Let's see. What about putting a mirror up there and we aim it at the mirror so it bounces back? Just an right. idea. Or if we did a sound effect, maybe. Okay. No, that I didn't work either. <laughs> um, how about I just do a chicken wing when it's time to advance the slide? Is that... Uh, <clears throat> All right, so um, go ahead. So with these uh, performance pillars, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about our journey and how we landed on the specific areas that we're looking at for continuous improvement. So back in the summer of 2020, in the midst of trying to get a return to learn plan in place, and that was a, a large topic of our conversation, we also focused on our commitments and our shared beliefs as a staff. And during the, the summer, we met as a district leadership team along with an instructional leadership team that included our coaches and leaders throughout. And throughout the process, we ended up landing on, I should have printed this, I really should in front of me, but um, we landed on some specific areas that we needed to grow in, but we also looked at some, some major celebrations that we had. The journey itself led us to revise and evolve from our strategic plan into a process of continuous improvement. And from that process of continuous improvement, we landed on four specific pillars. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the goals associated with each of those pillars, and I'm gonna have different members of, of the teams to be part of that. Um, within the groups themselves, we developed impl implement implementation teams on what it would look like and how we're going to drive some of that learning and some of that professional growth. And then ultimately, we're looking at cascading the goals and the components into a, a strategy that's called Plan, Do, Study, Act. And it's really focusing on how we're see seeing and achieving results in the specific areas that we want to grow in. So this is a snapshot of our specific performance pillars. The first is student learning and achievement, and underneath are the key performance indicators that we have for each, or for that specific lens. Next, we have safe and orderly school, along with the key performance indicators. We have operational and financial management is another pillar with the key performance indicators. And then we have engagement and how that involves students and staff. Um, each of the pillars has a specific belief statement that tries to encompass the overall goal and vision of what it is that, that we believe within connection to those particular pillars. With each of the areas, we've broken down into specific indicators that are gonna help us show our movement toward achieving the, the goals of the, of the various um, pillars themselves. So the first one is student learning and achievement. And underneath, we have three specific areas, skill proficiency, uh, citizenship, college, and career readiness, jumpstart to success, and inclusive practices. Um, I'm going to speak specifically to curriculum alignment and grading and assessment. And then um, two other teammates are going to join me for the other two components within student learning and achievement. The next slide has the specific goals. So, the very first one on the far left, skill proficiency. We have four goals that we're working on, and I did reference this, these goals back in the June board meeting and again in the July board meeting. But the work that we've started in the 2019-2020 school year builds on priority standards, learning targets. We're moving toward rubrics and assessments. And this is one of the most important issues that, that we have going for us because the, the goal is to show how we're making progress on the things that matter most within our departments. And these are the goals that we're going to be working through. Something that I'm really excited about with our early release Wednesdays is this is some of the work that we can, we can look at kind of the, the bigger fish to fry, the things that we're kind of always working toward long term as opposed to the day-to-day -day things that happen within a classroom. So these are the main goals that we have with skill proficiency. Um, Scott Carr, our College and Career Readiness Coordinator, is going to come and talk specifically about the middle key performance indicator. And then 
after that, we will hear from our new Director of Student Services. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Uh, what, what I'm going to represent is what's in the middle, and uh, I'll just go through them uh, fairly quickly. The first goal there is that all of our Oreo time uh, coaches will complete ACP career awareness and readiness activities with their grade level students that they're assigned. I did hand out a, um, uh, the DPI table of ACP components, so you could take a look at that. That represents the different uh, activities. Um, it also identifies the process of, of academic and career planning as it comes through uh, DPI. Yeah. Scott, could I just ask that sure. you um, define what some of these acronyms are? Are you guys sure. in, in the field sure. all the time? You speak these every day, sure. but a lot of board members don't. Sure. A ACP is academic and career planning. And then I'll, I'll cover CTE in just a second. Thank you. But if you take a look at the table of ACP components, so academic and career planning, you'll see it across the top that it leads with no, and then it goes to explore, plan, and then go. So ideally, we're looking at our students to, to know their self-awareness, and that is one of the key uh, uh, indicators that we're looking for. So um, career awareness, and then also career readiness. Uh, to note also on that form, it does mention this is not just career, obviously, there's academic um, is also included, the different activities, it's broken out. The second one is uh, CTE, uh, instructors will complete community connections activities within courses that they teach. We decided to start with our CTE courses, and CTE is career technical education, and we offer uh, around 61, uh, different CTE courses within our within our uh, school district and on a yearly basis we see maybe five of them that are not uh, that we, we don't run on a given year based off of our students uh, a lack of interest um, the community connections piece to that would include um, offering business tours job shadows uh, covering work-based learning opportunities youth apprenticeship co-op uh, a lot of those, uh, along with dual credits, a lot of those uh, are part of our new graduation requirements for our 2025 grads. And we really felt that starting this process in our CTE courses would be a, a great starting point. <clears throat> Excuse me. The third is all teachers will incorporate grad profile activities into their classroom beginning in uh, semester two. We want to take some time to be able to pull together how we'll do this in our in our classes. Uh, you'll see in front of you also our grad profile, which was pulled together last year by a, a team uh, that included uh, business partners, uh, coaches, teachers, counselors, uh, students. Uh, it was it was a lot of great work, and and that's what we pulled together. Uh, an example of that would be. Uh, maybe a teacher may have discussion in a classroom around being a lifelong learner, which is one of the is the top one, and they may include different cr uh, critical attributes uh, such as problem solving and being coachable. Uh, a lot of this takes place in our classrooms to begin with. Uh, we feel that a grad profile will tightens that a little bit and identifies what we're looking for out of our students once they graduate here from HUHS. So those are the three areas for CCCR, jump, jump start to success. Okay, in the area of inclusive practices, we're really looking at building and sustaining a shared and collective understanding of all stakeholders. And so really reviewing and analyzing um, current information and really determining what additional information will be needed. And this will really transpire through a comprehensive special education visioning process, um, resulting with an action plan really targeting those areas of opportunity and corresponding action steps. And so really soliciting information and feedback from our staff, both special and reg regular education, as well as our students and our families, um, parents, guardians, and 
move forward really in parallel and collaboration with teaching and learning on the skill proficiency side as well. Um, really looking forward to this collaboration, have already had in a very short time um, some really valuable feedback and we'll continue that journey this fall as we move forward in really analyzing where we're at and developing an action plan um, moving forward. So our next area and pillar is safe and orderly schools, and these are the specific key performance indicators underneath those. And members of our team will share. Good, good evening, everybody. I'm Jeremy Lupus, Associate Principal. Um, I'll talk briefly here about reducing the mod rate. Um, very skinny definition of mod rate is um, the additional premium that an employer would have to pay if there was a worker injury on site. Um, pretty much the average in the industry would be one per at, at a solid one. I'm happy to report that Hartford Union High School is under that at um, 0 0.87. So what that really means um, is that we're, we're a very, very safe school. Um, and Obviously, safe schools is more than just the students who come in every single day. It's about the over 100 employees that come and, and call this place home. So one of the main uh, parts of keeping a safe and orderly school is making sure that it is a physical safe environment. And uh, Mike McIntyre had talked about that plan, do, study, act. And one of uh, the key things that I'm looking forward to this year is, is working with our science department and our tech ed department, kind of reviewing a lot of the safety procedures that they go through with their own students, um, because those are very high um, potential hazardous areas with chemicals and large vehicles, et cetera. Because I think a good communication with students obviously makes for an adult uh, workspace pretty safe. Um, the second one would also be kind of uh, working with our food service and our custodian staff, kind of doing a little bit of an audit of what our safety procedures are, especially when there becomes a leak in the ceiling. Um, obviously, I think everybody can come up in their own mind about a slippery floor and you see the classic yellow um, caution tape or, you know, cone. So could really, as my role as the associate principal, working with a lot of those individual departments, making sure we're still up to date on what our procedures are and how do we make sure that those safety procedures are known to every kid in the building because it's pretty much a team effort. That is, that is mine. Um, another area in preparation and response um, to, to speak about tonight is specifically related to um, emergency, general emergency response drills and protocols. Um, you know, really purposely attending to both the preventative and the reactive processes and plans that we have in place and practices. Um, so really engaging in the regular review of those protocols. Um, had the privilege already to work uh, with our SRO um, here within the school, which is a wonderful opportunity. So really a collaboration among our school staff and outside agencies um, to move forward in enhancing uh, the various response protocols that we already have. We have many, many positive proactive strategies and pieces in place, and it's really continuing to enhance, review, um, and move forward in that direction. So really excited um, in this area as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next one is financial and operational management. Um, the first thing we'll be looking at as a technology plan is to create a five-year technology plan, and we want to make sure that we're with our current trends in instructional technology in our classrooms. Along with that uh, is a five-year facility plan. Obviously, we are doing a lot of work around the, the uh, building, um, both in and out side. But we have um, other areas in the, in the building, uh, infrastructure-wise, and um, that need to be addressed as well as we go forward. One is we have a 20-year um, kind of plan for roof repairs based on warranties that the board has seen in previous years. Also, along with that is fiscal responsibility. Um, and the three areas we concentrate on are the audit report, fund balance, and our bond rating. Okay. 
That's fine. I'll do it. <laughs> um, so in the technology plan, at the end of the 21-22 school year, a plan will be um, in place, reviewed, and adjusted per technology needs. Obviously, especially in the last three or four years, a lot of changes you know, go on with technology, and then we don't see that slowing down. Also, we will assess the needs of the district and in, implement the current trends, as I said before, that will help um, hopefully improve student growth and efficiency. For the facilities plan, at the end of the 21-22 school year, we'll have a five-year capital plan that will be uh, developed and approved by the board to address uh, the repairs on buildings and grounds and upgrades, as I mentioned before. Uh, and on a yearly basis, um, the administration and board will, will review and update as that is needed and as priorities change, depending on the condition of buildings and infrastructure. And on the financial responsible side, the yearly audit will find three or less, have three or less findings, no significant deficiencies, uh, unmodified opinion. Per board policy, the general fund balance will be maintained at 25% of the current year expenditures, and our bond rating will stay at where it is now per standard of poor as a, as a double A. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask you a question on that? It's just a quick one, and if it's... Um too technical to get to right now, we can talk later on, but is there anything in particular that's keeping a district at a double A? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into the rating. There's not many districts or uh, that are triple A in the state. Um, it used to be uh, Moody's was kind of the go-to, but now it's standard and pours. Um, fund balance is a, is a, um, is a contributor. Um, Growth in the district, growth in the EAV, um, you know, just the general um, economic um, economics of the area. Those are some of the factors that go into it. It's kind of hard unless you were low to get back to get higher than much higher than that. All right, very well, thank you. Yep. Um, the next pillar is engagement, and if you see up here, these are our three main areas of student enrollment, which we want to retain our district students, staff engagement, we also want to make sure that we're retaining them and making them feel part of our culture, which goes to culture building, and last is student engagement, is really providing a place for students to feel like they belong in that connectedness. So with student enrollment, what we want to do for the plan to make sure that we're retaining our students that live in the district boundaries is one of the things is we're going to kick off with Ozzy Fest is propose a plan regarding outdoor facility improvements. Um, increase our work or maintain our work with different youth groups, our Hartford area school districts, and other community events. And also get involved with different businesses, bring them in here, take our students out, and build those connections and invite them to various events. With staff engagement, I'll let Mary talk about that. For staff engagement, um, we would like to retain at least 91% of the staff. A uh, principal will send out an engagement survey. This will typically happen um, in the spring to all the staff to complete. One of our other goals is to track the number of staff that are working or attending our co-curricular activity events. We want to build a culture within our school district at HUHS to engage staff outside of um, the school day and have them come to the students um, and see their like, activities that are happening outside of the classroom. The Celebrations and Commodity Committee, we're going to plan three to four events. Um, currently, right now, we do a homecoming, um, the night of homecoming, a fun night for all families, the staff and their families to come. And then we've also done like a holiday party as well. A couple other um, ideas was maybe like a brewer game or going to the herd game um, to get the staff engaged and just to get to know each other. And then um, we have the wellness activities for staff. And currently, right now, we on professional development days, they are able to take an hour on professional development days and utilize the fitness center, the pool. Um, they can do like a walking club with each other. Um, and then last year in 
May, we had, um, they were able to go to Pike Lake. Um, so we feel that wellness is very important for them um, as well. And then with student engagement, uh, we're going to continue to have uh, competitions throughout the year with our Oriole Time mentors and Oriole classes. Um, identify a percentage of students participating in different activities. Um, and I usually give that presentation to you on a uh, season um, board report. Um, then students will develop connections with their mentors during their Oriole Time throughout the school year. Um, and then Kelly plans to meet with different groups of students once a month uh, to keep engaging them as well. So based on the amount of goals within our performance pillars, it is a ambitious undertaking. There's a lot that we have going on in terms of each of those pillars, but I think breaking it down this way allows us to see what it is that we're targeting, what we're doing. But I think more importantly that we all have a stake in every one of these pillars. Every staff member should be aware of the the things that are going on in each of the pillars, and this gives us the opportunity to do that in a more kind of parsed out piece within each of the pillars themselves. So that's our overview for our the HUHS district performance pillars. And at this time we can take any questions. I may call on others to help build some, under, some additional understanding if necessary. Mike, I'll lead. I have a, a general question for the team. These look amazing. Thank you for all the work that you and the entire team did on this. Um, it, it makes sense. It's laid out very clearly. A question I have is um, when can we look to hear back in terms of how we're doing on these pillars? Yeah, so one of the changes that we're going to be making to our board meetings is we will have an, a regular update um, built in similar to the superintendent report where we will have a component for each. It might not be every single board meeting, but when when we have an update to share, that's when we can continue to, to demonstrate where we're growing. Thank you. Do any other board members have some questions? Um, yeah, I have a question. Tina? Under, I think the principal was speaking on, mm, back, there's so much going on here, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Right, you know, and I just think the importance of making sure that our academics are really, the standards are high, so that we can retain and keep our students yeah, and others. I mean, I didn't hear much on that. No, just and I, I do think that that's a big part of the skill proficiency key performance indicator on the far left. Oh, okay. So focusing on those priority standards and making sure that our instruction, assessment, and feedback all aligns to specific things that we prioritize within departments is going to give us the opportunity to set goals, set growth goals within um, each course. It'll also build some consistency across all of our courses. So when we have multiple teachers teaching the same course, we're focusing on the same priorities. And then as a that's a universal instruction level. But this was also significantly going to help our ability to reach our most struggling students and to enhance the experiences for our most accelerated students. Okay, the other question I have then is, I don't know if it pertains to this or not, have you ever done an audit of your curriculum? Has the school ever, you know, like Slinger does every two years? So I'm I'm in my first just finishing my first year. Okay. Um, I'm not sure when the last time we did a curriculum audit. I know that my process has been to focus on uh, the standards and the way that we're driving instruction based on that. Um, I do think that this process that we're going through on um, looking specifically at what we prioritize within our classes is a, a component of that. Okay, I mean, would you be open to having an audit for your curriculum? Because I'm reading all this stuff that you sent us, and it's, I mean, it took me hours just to go through some of this. And yeah, Right, we, we have a lot of offerings. And I, well, what specifically do you mean by an audit? Well, it would, I mean, I think, you know, to get the parents involved, 
in some of this, you know, to read some of the material that, you know, is required of the children and students. I think it would be nice to have some of these parents read some of these requirements. And, I mean, I just, you know, I didn't know if the school did, but I guess I heard that it's required that a school should do an audit of their curriculum every two years. And so I'll just I'll just jump in, and I think some of the focus on what Mike is talking about leads into those conversations about doing such a thing. But I would also say that if the conversation is about transparency and communication with parents and families, there'll be an opportunity for our families this year through Schoology to see things more than ever that they haven't seen previously in regards to what is being done in each of their child's classes. And mm -hmm. again, we'll, we'll roll that out here in the next couple of weeks so parents better understand what they can access now in Schoology and see more of what the resources that are being used in class will be. Okay. Do any other board members have a question? Hey, Mike, how are we doing on retain or bringing new students into the district? Our numbers are we, where our numbers at? Do we have that number yet for new students, roughly? You know, at this point, no matter where I've been, whether it's a Union High School district or a, a, a K-12 district, uh, the middle of August is probably one of the worst times to answer that question. Um, just because there's all those families that have yet to go through the registration process. And because as a high union high school district, every student that comes to us is considered a new student. It's not an automatic roll up from eighth grade like it is in a K-12 district. So we will certainly have a much better idea for you at the board meeting in September in regards to what that enrollment looks like. Sounds good, thank you. Any other board members have a question or comment? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you. And then just the last comment I would like to make about that is for certainly appreciation for the leadership team in navigating the work as we transition from those of you in the district to remember the strategic plan. This is us transitioning from that work to something, again, that we're identifying as our district performance pillar. So that's kind of the nexus or the continuation of, of the work. And, and to be honest, based upon our first speaker, questions about student achievement and outcomes of students fits nicely into these conversations. Um, next, I'd like to update everyone on capital improvement projects. Uh, while I'm speaking, McCoy, if you could just pull up that presentation. Um, I do know there's some friends or new friends of mine in the back um, from J.P. Cullen, who have been instrumental in planning over the past couple of months. And speaking of outcomes and graduates, I believe two of the three, if I see Katie and Tyler uh, wave, those are proud HUHS graduates. Uh, working for J.P. Collin, um, and, and they've been uh, um, very involved in some of the conversations that we've been having recently. Um, so the presentation on the screen, some of this is a review. If you could just go ahead and play it. Thank you, McCoy. Um, some of this is a review. Some of it's a conversation about where we've been, and then some of it is a conversation about where we hope to go with some of the campus improvements. Again, a reminder, Friday this week, we hold a ribbon-cutting ceremony at 4.30 p.m., in front of the high school to celebrate some of what we've shared here in the first few slides or what I will share here in the first few slides um, and appreciate any and all members of our community to join us for the celebration as well as some building tours to follow. We won't stop there. Okay, who's hitting an arrow that is working against my arrow? Um, Okay, so some of it, and we have this displayed, and again, the tours will show you more. We do have a tour scheduled at the end of the board meeting tonight. Obviously, we have two weeks until kids come into our district um, for the first day of school. You will see certain things that are just not quite uh, done at this point. But our district has invested $5.5 million um, in campus improvements in the last 18 months. And that was the district um, designating those dollars um, to, to make some of our spaces uh, more flexible, safer, um, and also gets into that conversation about creating a, a district that attracts kids and kids want to be at each day. So again, from science to the bathrooms to the space we sit in today, fitness center, um, front offices, you can see all of those spaces 
in regards to how it started and how it's going. Um, that set the foundation for us um, to again, hopefully uh, celebrate that on Friday with members of our community. And again, you'll get a chance to see that. If you can just go ahead to the next slide, and then Mr. Helms will get into the conversations that we've had the last few months about where we need to go in regards to some of our challenges outside. So you can see from uh, some of the pictures you're gonna see right here that there's two areas of great concern, our current track as well as our tennis court conditions. Um, the company came, came last year uh, to repair our track and told us this is the last time they would do it. Uh, it's passed, it's 20 years. Um, and now we're starting to see in lanes seven and eight uh, major cracks throughout the, not just the, the surface, but also the underlayer, uh, which could cause us some problems even next track season. Next slide. So here you can see, even after repair, uh, the surface is starting to wear away, especially um, in those lanes that are highly used. Um, actually, Mr. Walters is in lane one a lot, walking at night, and so that's why that's starting to wear away too. Um, here's our tennis courts. Um, the base there um, is not in good shape. Uh, we have multiple cracks as well as surface peeling. Uh, areas where water is starting to settle, but also bubbles showing up within our surface. Um, so you can see just from these pictures, um, especially um, in courts seven and eight, um, towards the road where the water comes off that secondary soccer practice field, that's where we're seeing a lot of uh, problems there. These are the courts across the street um, that we have not used in possibly 10 years. Um, so the nets have been taken off, the fences are starting to fall apart a little bit. Um, but obviously you can't use that court at all for any type of recreation or athletic competitions. So here is the uh, new proposal um, for behind school. Um, we are going to be fixing the track um, and creating a, a football complex within, within that track. Um, so creating a nice track and football complex, that track will be turfed. Um, in order to allow our teams to practice there as well as compete. Uh, we've already had to practice several times uh, in the field house this fall uh, due to the weather. If you go back a little bit. So you'll see the relocations of the field events into one central location, but also an area where it could have lighting if needed, um, especially pole vault. Uh, if you've ever been to a track meet, pole vault is always one of the longest events, and sometimes we run out of daylight for that. Um, must be on the timer. Um, so, so here's an entryway um, where we'll see uh, tickets being taken, as well as donor walls and a plaza there. Uh, this main entryway here would come off of our student lot, um, which would provide a lot of parking uh, in our student parking instead of just street parking like we have now down at Gidmar. So it provides uh, handicap parking as, also, as well as ADA accessibility. Just another image of what that might look like in the proposal. Um, donor walls and bricks. Um, there you see the relocation of the field events, uh, all the jumps. Um, are circled there on the left, and then a large area for shot and disc to create a, a safe area for those events to happen as well. Two different bleacher systems. Uh, we currently um, have one major bleacher system down at Gibmar, a secondary bleacher system for the uh, visiting site, which is a track bleacher system, which uh, doesn't seat a lot and doesn't create a lot of visible um, areas for the spectators. But here we would see about 1,500 seats for the home side and 750 for visiting. The home side would also create storage underneath for all of our equipment, track and football. Here's the current press box uh, proposal. Um, it's got two different sides. Um, our current press box is very small, not just for our coaching staff and game management, but also for media. Um, but so it provides an indoor as well as an outdoor platform um, for media and coaching staff uh, to see the games. Here's our current tennis location. So we're just renovating those courts uh, in, in the same exact spot, just creating a better base and surface, but also adding lighting uh, to this area. 
Here's our current concession stand restroom area. It'll be much bigger um, to incorporate team rooms, but also create a secondary area for parking. Um, so they're not on the streets, but also a secondary area for entrance. Again, another area to create handicap parking and ADA accessibility, as well as uh, emergency vehicles. So there's kind of the proposed um, concession stand, team rooms, bathrooms. Um, it's amazing when you go through this process, the codes you have to follow for how many urinals and toilets you need uh, in each, each uh, restroom. Can I just jump in, Scott? I yep. remember one of the questions specifically that Ms. Pridemore asked last month was about, maybe, I don't want to use the word, but like why so extravagant or something. Right. If you look at that picture, that's a starting point based upon code. To me, that seems really extravagant to think that we need that many stalls in a restroom facility, but we're not the ones who would determine that. So as the planning went further into conversations and worked with, again, municipal city code and things like that, that's an opportunity to have more conversations about that. But we're just doing what we're told or the, you know, Cullen is doing what they're being advised as far as based on this many people served and this is how many stalls you need in a bathroom. But again, when I looked at that compared to what we have now, like, whoa, that's that's a lot to me. Mm -hmm. But just to kind of connect those two conversations. I'll give you a good example in our community, too, or the, the, the pool. If you've ever been in the, the locker rooms there, there's just tons of restroom area. And that's because of the capacity that that pool can hold. That's all up to code. Um, so this is in the back corner of our complex behind school. Uh, we create a large square piece of turf, uh, which could then, then hold two softball diamonds uh, facing each other with portable um, softball fences. Um, if need be, we could also create one of those into a baseball field and move the fences back, uh, but creating a good area uh, for practice area for soccer and football. When it's not baseball or softball season, we take the fences away, creates just a large area of turf where you don't have to worry about the drainage, drainage issues that we currently have. And then the grass areas, um, those would just be improved with drainage um, for soccer and multi-purpose fields. Um, so football, soccer, FIED, uh, but adding drainage and continuing to keep that irrigation there. Just another picture of all the grass areas that we need to add irrigation. So when those were done 20 plus years ago, the irrigation was taken out of that plan. And that's why we see the water sit back there. It was planned for irrigation, but taken out at the last second. So that's just a quick summary of all the different improvements behind school um, with the track and football complex, the field event relocation, um, renovating the tennis courts, adding drainage, um, adding stands and some backstops, dugouts for the baseball, softball areas, and that additional parking lot. Um, transitioning the current football um, soccer field into soccer only is one of our main goals in creating a home for our soccer program, um, renovating that softball complex and transition that softball diamond into dual purpose, um, but also adding grandstands, dugouts, bullpens, and then an additional eight tennis courts that will be across the street. So here's what we would call the Lincoln Athletic Fields, which currently the two softball diamonds and Gidmar is. So Gidmar would now be turn, turned into a soccer complex only. Um, within that soccer complex, it'd be turf. We could hold multiple uh, youth events. Uh, there can fit eight U8 uh, fields. There could be four U8 fields and two U12 fields for tournaments for our youth programs. Um, and so you can see there creates a, a shelter for our teams to be protected during weather, which they currently don't have then creates a nice grandstand, the current grandstand we have for soccer games. So there's kind of the diagrams. I know it looks a little chaotic, but there you can see the different types of fields you can put within that big square of synthetic turf for youth groups in our community. Now we're taking and uh, proposing those two softball diamonds. They're currently were made for uh, men's softball. Um, turfing those fields and creating multi-purpose softball and baseball, creating dugouts, grandstands, bullpens, um, and creating a nice atmosphere, atmosphere down there, but also a great place to hold tournaments for our community clubs. <clears throat> so just a little diagram to kind of show you what it may look like um, with grandstands and a press box um, for, our, for our spectators. Right now we sit on picnic benches and aluminum bleachers. 
So there'll be additional tennis courts across the street, eight more, so that'd give us a total of 16. Um, that means that we can hold all the major tennis uh, tournaments that we like to host instead of sharing courts with Slinger, but also having subsectionals and things like that here for WI tournament series. <clears throat> so I think that's just a, a review of all the things that I just talked about across the street. Um, and then there's, there's some side conversations going on with the uh, city of Hartford and some of the baseball clubs um, for the uh, West Side Park baseball complex. Um, so those groups are working together right now. This is the home of our varsity baseball field. Uh, there's no bleachers at all or dugouts that need to be improved. And so those groups are working together right now. Um, and that cost is somewhere around $600,000 that the city of Hartford and the baseball clubs, youth and adult leagues are working on. Mr. Walters, take over now. Yeah, so then lastly, um, J.P. Cullen again has looked at some comparables of what other districts have done in situations like ours and similar campaigns um, and arrived at what we've determined to be an Orioles Onward fundraising campaign that we rolled out last Friday at the Athletic Department Golf Outing and will officially kick off this Friday at our ribbon-cutting building tours, Aussie Fest, and first home football game, which I might add, will have fans in the stands. Um, we, we've included a packet, or uh, we've included um, that document in the packet for each of our board members. Um, and anybody else who would like one, we would certainly love to share as many with you as possible. Um, and again, it's, 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 a, it's a plan that takes anything from a brick of in the hundreds of dollars through sponsorships up to $100,000 to naming rights um, with the highest naming right of a $500,000 contribution for the football track complex. Um, we, need, we need our community's help. We need uh, our partner's support um, to build some momentum for this project. Again, our task when I arrived was to identify areas within our building. We went through two phases to do that. We are positioned uh, more from a flexible and structural environment, from a safer environment with the work that we've done inside of our campus. And now we need to partner with um, those individuals interested in helping support this project. I think I will stop there and see if there are any questions or feedback from the board. Um, I have a question. So you want to do this all at one time, all these projects? No. Um, obviously, we would have to have a plan to finance the projects. But with any project of this magnitude, we would have to phase them. Um, to occur to try to preserve the seasons and also have the financing or funding available to do that. So as an example, just a, just a quick idea that I would throw out there for consideration is as, uh, we have eight tennis courts currently that are um, in their last year or two of usage. Okay, If we could get up to a point where we could build the eight new tennis courts on the diamond where those the old concrete is across the street, we could do that while they're finishing playing on the current eight get those eight tennis courts built, and then go and demolish the other eight tennis courts and know that we already have tennis courts available for our student athletes to use because we invested in that first. Same thing with the track and things like that. So it certainly has to be done in a phased in approach. And what is the full cost of this? So yeah, that's a good question. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to remind everybody listening. Again, a reminder, we uh, started at uh, in the ballpark of $14.4 million dollars. Um, just after some fine tuning, we reduced it down to 12, $12.4 million. Um, and obviously, um, are using that as a target to begin our fundraising campaign to offset um, as much of that cost as possible. Mr. Helms, are there any surfaces that you feel may not necessarily be safe for the athletes? Well, I would, I would say, um, depending how our track comes out of the winter season uh, with the changing of the ground levels, um, we, we may see some problems in the seventh and eighth lane. Um, but also, if we would put a basketball team on a court that had the cracks and problems on that, that are on the tennis court right now, I would say that's not safe. Okay. And I'll just, I'll just piggyback off of that. So our two urgent needs are the track and the tennis courts as far as the inability to use those facilities in the very new, near future. Okay, we will not be able to use those based upon 
you know, some of the images. And if we want to take a look out there at some point together, we could do that. That's the urgent need. The other urgent need to me is the fact that our student athletes are losing opportunities on a regular basis based upon the drainage and the inability to keep the fields in a condition that's playable. Okay. The plan that's proposed here, as an example, gives us an opportunity to use our game fields for practice. Right now, we don't use our varsity game field for practice because we don't have confidence that it will be available on Friday nights. Okay, That's an obstacle to taking care of our student athletes. So um, when do you plan on starting this project? <laughs> We've officially What's started. The... We've officially started the campaign, and that will help drive if and when a project starts. Okay, we, so we can't predict the future. If we get if we get zero participation and support, um, that answers the question. Okay, and we need our community to come together, and that'll help decide if and when we start. Okay. Do any other board members have a question? Is there anything else you'd like to add, gentlemen? Okay, hearing none, we'll go forward. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Great, and then the last part of my report is regarding our operational procedures. Um, so if McCoy, um, you could just pull up that short information. If you wanna scroll down to the graph. Or if it's a separate file. Um, but again, while we're pulling, there it is, thank you. Um, I'd like to discuss the plans for returning to school on September 1, and again, we've adjusted our operational procedures for your consideration this evening. Um, taking a quick look at the past, our operational procedures last year consisted of masks being required, goals of distancing up to six feet, sanitization, ventilation, and following recommendations on quarantine and isolation of positive cases from our county health department. Those procedures allowed us to get to May 3rd, and on May 3rd, we moved to a masks in motion concept where students who were seated in a location more than three feet apart were not required to wear a face covering. Then on May 18th, we adjusted the procedures again further by changing face coverings to recommended and not required. These adjustments in May were based upon what our most local data was telling us and we knew it was time to be less restrictive with our mitigation strategies. I've said all along that our goal is to have kids on campus, and while again we sit here listening to many opinions about the best way to start the school year, my recommendation for support tonight is based upon being least restrictive, but still accomplishing our goal based upon our current data. So here's the information I received this morning, and as you can tell, while there certainly has been a small spike in our county, it's important to note that back in November, we capped at somewhere near 1,600 per 100,000 residents, and now our cases are right around near 200 per that same number of residents. As I explained in the spring, this is an over 80% reduction. And despite the most recent slight uptick, it calls for mitigation strategies that aligns to our current numbers. Further information from the county this morning shows that hospitalizations, total cumulative cases continue to slightly increase, but have basically plateaued over the last few months. So with that, face coverings as a choice is our recommendation for all students, staff, and visitors to our campus. And if McCoy, you'd like to pull up that language, I'd appreciate it. Any events sanctioned? Yep, right up on top, I believe. Yep, that top paragraph right there. So face coverings are a choice for all students, staff, and visitors to our campus. Any events sanctioned by the WIAA or held at other venues must follow their organization's guidelines. I'm sure all of us have been watching. We know there are schools in our conference who have had a requirement for the start of the school year supported by their boards. When we as visitors to those campuses, camp I, campuses, um, or as student athletes go into their buildings on those campuses, 
there will be a requirement. We do not have the ability to control that. Students who test positive will be isolated per the health department recommendations. Contact tracing will occur with students identified as close contacts being communicated with, but not required to quarantine unless they are symptomatic. I want to point out we had zero evidence last year of transmission. And we also had zero evidence of transmission in any of the close contact type sports that our students participated in. We will continue with cleaning and disinfection, increased ventilation, encourage proper hand washing and use of sanitization stations. Distancing will be encouraged whenever possible. And as we have since we started, we will continue to monitor our local data and adjust these practices as necessary with a focus on maintaining our ability to provide a safe and successful on-campus experience for all students. We've done this together before. We've been successful in our response to the pandemic from the start. We've made decisions on what we thought was right for our district, and I'm confident that we will continue to lead the way moving forward. I will take any questions or feedback from the board, and again, you'll have a chance to vote on these recommendations in a bit. Do any board members have a question for Mr. Walters? Uh, Mr. Walters, I do have one question. In regarding to a student with a positive test, do you know how soon after that positive test result that they could try to test again? We've heard in recent months about some of the testing procedures not necessarily being as accurate as what was hoped. So I'm, I'm just curious about that. Yeah. Um, we just got information again from the county regarding that. Um, frankly, I do know some districts are advertising 14 days. But I've been led to believe, and I just want to double check that it's 10 days in regards to that isolation. But I'm not sure if there is a test opportunity to return before that for positive cases. But I will check on that. Okay, so just so I'm clear, um, as we look at the way this is worded now, it sounds to me like that will be adjusted or dependent upon the recommendations from the county. Is that correct? Correct. And again, just to be clear for everybody who's listening, um, so we're not using the words uh, inconsistently, is isolation is the word that should be used with positive cases and quarantine is the word that should be used for close contacts. So the recommendation is that we are not quarantining students. We are isolating positive cases when we become aware of them. And again, for everybody listening, we've had two positive cases since the school year ended that we were notified of our from our county health department since graduation in June. Two positive cases that we were notified of. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Jeff, what are we doing on the buses? I've had questions about buses. Are they going to have to wear masks on Wittenberger's buses? So as a... As a, as a contracted service that we have an agreement with Wittenberger, um, we are not going to um, get in the way of the conversations that Wittenberger has with their um, transportation. There is a order out there that says public transportation does include school buses and that there's an expectation that they are required. In our conversations with others, there has been a mixed signal in regards to whether that applies or not. So we are not going to address that, which therefore puts that responsibility on Wittenberger to follow the order that they're being asked. If they don't follow that order, that's on them. Thank you. Any other questions from members? Thank you, Mr. Walters. Um, our building tour got moved to the end of the meeting. There is no old business. So up next is our new business. First, we have proposal 22-2802, approval of the 2020-2021 budget amendment. Is there a motion on this proposal? Motion. Motion by Tina. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Ross. So we have a motion and a second on the table for the approval of the 2020-2021 budget amendment. And it looks like we have Mark Powell at the podium. 
This is a yearly um, year-end adjustments to the budget per recommendations of the auditors and DPI. Board members, the information is in our packet as well. Do you have any questions? <coughs> Hearing none, we have a proposal on the table for, I'm sorry, we have a motion and a second on the table for proposal 22-2802, approval of the 2020-2021 budget amendment. We're going to take a roll call vote, starting with Tina. Yes. Aye. 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 And the proposal has been approved. Thank you. Up next is proposal 22-2803, approval of the 2021-2022 operational procedures. Is there a motion on this proposal? So moved. Motion by Jim Gum. Is second. there a second? Seconded by Tina Pridemore. Are there any discussion or question items related to this proposal? Hearing none, let's go forward with a vote. All those in favor of passing proposal 22-2803, approval of the 2021-2022 operational procedures, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion carries, proposal 22-2803 has been approved. Up next, we have proposal 22-2804, approval of the revised 2021-2022 employee handbook. Is there a motion on this proposal? So moved. Motion by Craig Westfall. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Ross Curley. We have a motion and a second on the table. Is there a discussion or questions related to this proposal? We have Mary Lynn Christian at the podium. Anything like you'd, you'd like to present, Mary Lynn? I just revised the years of service under additional notes. The second, third, and fourth bullet regarding um, substitutes as far as the years of service and how we count the years of service. So those three um, bullets were updated. So the years of service for substitutes um, and then also continuing if a, a coach would happen to leave and come back that we would continue to um, provide the years of service for them. Thank you. Thank you for laying that out so clearly in the packet for us. I appreciate it. Any questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, we'll go forward with a vote. We have proposal 22-2804 on the table. It's the approval of the revised 2021-2022 employee handbook. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. The motion carries. The proposal has been approved. Proposal 22-2805 is approval of the purchase of a vehicle for the Special Education Department. Is there a motion on this proposal? So moved. Motion by Craig Westfall. Is there a second? A second. Seconded by Jim Gum. Is there any discussion or questions about this proposal? Tracy, I need to excuse myself due to a conflict in this matter as well. Thank you. Ross Curley would like to excuse himself from the vote due to a conflict of interest. Is there any questions? This is part of a transition grant that we received, so it's fully funded by the grant. We have to designate um, the grant monies in certain areas, and one of them was transportation that will provide an opportunity for students to do job shadowing type things. Stacy, right? Um, and we have a number of um, students currently that we have in these type of programs, and so we need an additional vehicle because a lot of times um, the current fleet is not available. Would this vehicle be able to use outside of that if it wasn't being used? No, because it has to be used for the grant purposes. Okay, so it can only be used for... Right, those. correct. Yeah. Okay. And it... It looks like it is being bought through the state contract. To build. So it's, it's discounted or state contract pricing. We always get that from Ewell. Okay, great. Any other questions from board members? Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. So we have proposal 22-2805, approval of the purchase of a vehicle for the special education department on the table. We're going to take a roll call vote, starting with Jim Gum. Aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries. The proposal has been approved. 
Up next, we have proposal 22-2806, approval of the CESA 1 contract for a school psychologist. Is there a motion on this proposal? So moved. Motion by Ross Curley. Thank you. Is there a second? No second. Seconded by Jim Gum. Is there a discussion on this item? I'll address any questions, but the history of it, that we had a psychologist on staff a couple of years ago and last year with the hiring of uh, Julie who was the previous student services person. She was a psychologist, and now that she has left, we need those services again, and it's been tough finding qualified people, and we don't need a full-time person, so um, as you know, CISA is an alternative for us to, to get those type of services without hiring somebody full-time, and so we're going through CISA 1, I believe, for those services. At the 60%, I believe it said. Thank you. Any further questions for Mark Powell? Yeah, I just Jim? want to say the fact that the school places a priority on providing opportunities for special needs kids to get internship opportunities as well as individuals that have mental health needs. I think should be applauded or supported. Thank you, Jim. Anything else from a board member? Hearing none, we have a proposal on the table. Um, a motion and a second for proposal 22-2806, approval of the CISA 1 contract for a school psychologist. Uh, we are going to take a roll call vote starting with myself. Aye. 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 Thank you. The motion is carried. Proposal 22-2806 has been approved. Up next on our agenda, we have the approval of the unanimous consent agenda. I would like to pull the minutes from the July meeting from this unanimous consent agenda and vote on that separately. So what we have in here up for vote right now is the approval of the vouchers, the treasurer's report, and the personal recommendations. Is there a motion on the unanimous consent agenda as proposed with my um, edit of pulling out the minutes? So moved. Motion by Jim, is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Ross Curley. So let's take a vote on the net. One second, Tracy. Can yes. Speak to a, um, just for the board's awareness, um, based on feedback um, for the personnel recommendations, we did not include all of the positions that we do not have a candidate for in regards to some of the co-curricular positions. Previously, we on that document, we had it listed where we put like still looking to be determined, things like that. But feedback kind of said, don't include those until you actually have a name. So there are 11 positions at this time that are not filled from chess club to FBLA, mock trial, things like that, that will come back to you when we have somebody for those positions. Okay, so let's get the word out. We still have 11 positions to fill. All right, let's take a vote on the unanimous consent agenda minus the minutes from the July 19th meeting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion carries. Um, Janet, please note that I did say aye as well. Um, I did pull the minutes from the unanimous consent agenda, and I just want to explain why. I had participated in a webinar for school board presidents, and it was brought up during the webinar and we received further um, clarification today that we have to be careful that our meeting minutes are true minutes and they include um, short points of substance that document our meeting and that we don't start to venture into a transcript type of document. So because if, if we're going to do a true transcript, that's a transcript. Minutes have specific points that they include and don't necessarily name particular people, comments, um, points of view, that kind of thing. So looking at these minutes, I, I can see and, and appreciate the detail that is in some of, um, some of the sections here. However, knowing what I now know, I think it is worthwhile to edit this and take this down to a... A shorter document which is more of a, an abstracts or synopsis of the essential elements that would be included in board meeting minutes but I did want to bring that to the board and have us take a vote on that um, Janet Jeff and I have talked about it as well as the advice we got today and we do we do want to go forward from this day forward with our minutes being more succinct 
and in alignment with what we're being advised to do, what is true meeting minutes. But it's up to this board tonight whether you would like to pass the, meet, the meeting minutes as is or we go back and have them edited and brought back for approval at the next meeting. So the vote that we should take tonight, Jeff, would it be on the meetings, on the minutes as is? Okay, so I separated those out, knowing what I said now, and I'd like to know if there are any further questions or comments about this. Jim? Uh, yeah, I have to, for transparency purposes, just so I understand, am, am I correct in saying that these meetings are um, videotaped, and if citizens or members wanted to see in the future what our individual comments actually were, if they're no longer going to be included in the minutes, uh, that citizens would have an opportunity to do that? Correct. That is correct. Okay. In addition to that, I just then, then would say, I'm, unless I hear differently and open for discussion, I'm not really in favor of going back and editing what's already been done. Um, I'd be more in favor of moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Would any other board members like to add a comment or a question about this? I, I agree with uh, Jim's statement that, you know, I don't, I want to move forward, not back, but I guess what I'd like to see is what your intent of that, these minutes are, what you thought they should be. I can, and what I, I mean, can do is just share out the advice that we've gotten. I mean, that, yeah, that's sure. basically that. Right. I mean, I'll just I, share out those, I, that specific advice that we've gotten. Right. And, and so all of you can see the reason behind the change for the next month uh, as a recap of this month. So at this time next month, you'll see the August minutes based upon the advice that we're talking about now. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you for including your perspectives as well. So I'm going to make a motion that we approve the July 19th minutes as presented in our packet. Is there a second on that? That's a It's a second by Jim. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And we've approved the minutes from the July 19th minute. July, July 19th meeting. Thank you very much. And last on our, up well, next on our agenda is the announcement of meetings and events. We've heard about Aussie Fest coming up on Friday. Did you want to add anything about that, Mr. Walters? Yeah, just a reminder, as I mentioned before, you know, Aussie Fest is two to seven. That's kind of a community festival. Celebrate um, the return to school and also kick off again the fundraising campaign. But again, specifically in regards to the building tours and ribbon cutting, that's at 4.30 p.m. also on Friday with tours beginning at 4.45 p.m. Thank you. We also have Freshman Jumpstart coming up August 30th and 31st. Our first day of school is September 1st. And on Labor Day, September 6th, there is no school. And Tracy, I just wanted to add during the announcements here that um, our Hartford School community, again, has been impacted by a tragedy in recent days. So if all of us could keep um, a local family of a 2018 graduate in their thoughts moving forward as they deal with the tragedy of losing somebody gone too soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, in regards to the board reflection, each board member has a page at their table spot. Um, please feel free to fill that out and get that to Janet, um, preferably before Wednesday of this week if you can. Do any board members have any um, quick points of reflection that they would like to add now at the end of our meeting verbally? Jim? I'd just like to echo uh, Superintendent Walter's uh, sentiments regarding the family that uh, lost a loved one. I'm certainly no tragedy or no uh, stranger to personal tragedy and uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to that family and all the loved ones. would also like to pass on to uh, Mr. McIntyre uh, and Mr. Walters that I did receive the information that was requested last month. I know the parent brought that up, and uh, I want to thank you for the uh, commitment to following through on that. Uh, I will uh, look it over with, with due diligence that I know we'll be talking about it in the future, but I appreciate uh, the follow-through on that and the substantive con conversation that followed. That's all I have. Thank you, Jim. 
I, I got Ross? just one. I got just one. I, the building looks excellent. Um, it's starting to come along outside, inside. Um, even the front. I came in the front tonight with all the flowers and everything for welcome to school, but uh, kids back to school. The custodians and everybody has done an excellent job in getting the school ready, and it, it looks welcoming. It's not. It's not the dungeon anymore. Back in the days when I when I came through here, and it's inviting, and it's it's come a long way, and it's kudos to everybody that's put the effort in to make the building look inviting. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Ross. Any other comments or questions from board members? All right, hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Actually, hang on one second, Jeff. Can we adjourn and then do the tour? Okay, we adjourn after the tour. Sorry about that. We're going to retract that. And, and again, I would thank everybody for being in attendance tonight. Um, we have uh, a lot of great things happening in our district and certainly appreciate our community's engagement in all of the work that we do. Again, just a reminder, we are still in session as we go around and take the tour quick. Okay, so we'll take the tour and then we will come back and adjourn the meeting. Thank you.